Come on in, guys. Welcome to Idled Out, where we talk all things Survivor. My name is Luke, and today we're talking about the Queen, finally. Yes, today we'll be counting down Sandra Diaz Twine's five best moves, and because no one's perfect, not even Survivor's first two-time winner, we'll also be talking about her single worst move across her four seasons playing Survivor. Probably best known for her Anybody But Me strategy, hilarious confessionals, and rivalries with some of Survivor's greatest villains like Johnny Fairplay and Russell Hance, Sandra is most definitely one of Survivor's most popular and beloved players. I mean, they themed an entire season around her and Boston Rob giving advice to players and built giant statues of their heads. If that isn't a canonization of her as a Survivor legend, I don't know what is. And even still, there are people out there who don't think that Sandra is particularly skilled in the game socially, strategically, or physically, and that she merely stumbled backwards into her two wins. But I don't know about that. Look, I'll uh, give you the last one. She did lose the final Pearl Islands immunity challenge to Lil, but I'm here to give credit where credit's due on the other two. From season 7 to season 40, let's count down Sandra's five best and single worst moves ever. You know what? I can get loud too! What the f Sandra's fifth best move is taking out Tony second in Survivor Game Changers. Now a little context here. Game Changers is a season notorious for having about 10 actual Survivor legends and 10 not as legendary players in the cast. After Sierra was voted out first, the big names on Mana realized they needed to stick together for their own sakes, or the Haley's, Troy Zans, and Varners of the world were going to pick them off one by one. So Tony, Aubrey, Malcolm, Sandra, and Caleb form the Big Threats plus Caleb Alliance to give themselves a solid majority of five. And Sandra's all in on this alliance. Everyone's all in. The viewers at home are all in. But... Tony's gonna Tony. Yeah, Tony's paranoia gets the better of him, causing a blow up between him and Sandra, and the Big Threats Alliance is disbanded faster than Quibi was. It's right about now that Sandra realizes that instead of being an equal voice in the Big Threat Alliance, she can be the queen of a lesser threats and her alliance. Begun, the Game Changers War has. Because Tony was unable to adjust to the slower pace of the game on Mana, Sandra was able to easily appeal to players like Troyzan, who didn't want to rock the boat too hard early on, or ever. And despite Tony's best attempts to plead with Malcolm and Caleb to vote out Sandra for her physical weakness, a desperate argument on season 34 of Survivor, Sandra wins the war and Tony's sent home second. On its face, it might seem like voting out one of two other winners on the season second only makes Sandra more vulnerable, but it actually had the opposite effect, reinforcing the loyalties of her subjects and putting the fear of God in all the other players. Despite the heartbreak of Tony going second, it was a fantastic play on Sandra's part and reinforced that she's just as good at playing way out front as she is playing from behind. Sandra's fourth best move is pitting JT and Michaela against each other in the first swap of Survivor Game Changers. Alrighty, I just talked about this on my video on Survivor's most notorious food thefts, so I'll try to be brief. But the Game Changers pre-merge is a more convoluted mess than seasons 4, 5, and 6 of Lost, so bear with me. Starting episode 4 off at post-swap Nuku, everyone's a bit down since Malcolm just went home in a joint tribal council. This is a huge blow to everyone on Nuku, as Malcolm's not only their best physical competitor, but also a trustworthy and well-liked ally, especially for JT, the only original Nuku member on new Nuku, who inadvertently got Malcolm voted out at the joint tribal council by telling his old alliance who was being targeted in hopes that they had idled out Sandra, but instead they idled out Malcolm. Okay, are you following this? I don't blame you if not. Game Changers has more characters and plot than a Tolstoy novel, and it doesn't tell us nearly as much about the human condition. Perhaps because JT's actions got Malcolm eliminated, or perhaps because he started this whole stand up and talk at tribal council thing, Sandra is in one mode. Punish. 
JT's also still full steam ahead with his plan to take out Sandra, which also isn't exactly helping his stock rise with her. So Sandra seizes on some petty drama between JT and Michaela in order to get her name completely out of the mix for who's going home next on this rapidly imploding tribe. Nuku won a coffee bar at a reward, and Michaela's coffee order of 90% sugar, 10% coffee irritates JT beyond all reason. Don't be a snob, JT. That's just the recipe for a Starbucks latte. Sandra decides to exacerbate this drama further and eats all the sugar, knowing that JT will instantly blame Michaela, who will respond defensively, tightening the tensions between the two even further. Let me see this jar of sugar she licked. I mean, and that's it for this jar. That's it, I This is done. I told you, that's crazy. The plan worked like a charm. As JT voted Michaela, Michaela voted JT, and Sandra could enact her revenge on JT for targeting her and for getting Malcolm voted out. Tell Malcolm you sent him home too. I will. Wow, I haven't seen JT this defeated since uh, the last time he was voted out. Sandra's third best move was getting in Russell's head that Coach was after him and getting Coach voted out in Survivor Heroes vs. Villains, sparing her from a pre-merge exit in that game. The Villains tribe dominated the early game of Heroes vs. Villains, losing only one villain in the first five boots of the season, and that was largely due to Boston Rob's leadership in challenges and at camp. But within the Villains tribe, a growing Russell-sized schism was emerging, and fast. After Russell, Parvati, and Danielle assume full control of the villains' camp and vote out Tyson and Rob, Sandra and Courtney are in a rough spot, to say the least. When they lose the final 12 immunity challenge, the writing is on the wall. They're outside of the new majority alliance, and they're by far the two weakest physically. It's a done deal. One of them is going home. Sandra and Courtney realize that flipping Jerry and Coach back to their side is a fool's errand, so Sandra does what she does best, preys on Russell's insecurities. I heard Coach was saying that he made a mistake and he wished he could go back. What mistake? In letting Rob go home. That he should have never made the choice that he made and that he's sorry. That's what he told her, and that he wanted to get rid of you. So, I don't know about your homeboy. Oh, he ain't my homeboy. Sandra convinced Russell that Coach regretted voting out Boston Rob and that he now wants to vote out Russell, despite Coach literally pledging fealty to Russell a few episodes earlier. This also had the added benefit of escalating tensions between Russell and Danielle, who didn't want her future makeout buddy and 180 co-star to get sent home. Had Sandra not convinced Russell to take out Coach here, Courtney goes in this episode and Sandra goes in the next. Instead, she positioned herself well for a final 10 flip to the Heroes Tribe to get rid of Russell once and for all. Which, despite not working out at all, we'll get to soon. Sandra's second best move is forming an alliance with Lil and Dara to vote out Burton at the final five of Survivor Pearl Islands. By the final five, Sandra was essentially a rogue agent, having lost her allies Rupert and Krista earlier in the game. And it was rather apparent by this point that Fairplay and Burton are kind of running away with this whole thing, and they've got Lil in their back pocket. When Burton won the car reward and took along John to enjoy it with him, Sandra used the time alone with Dara and Lil to forge a single day alliance of three to end this whole Burton and fair play nonsense once and for all, blindside Burton, and swing control of the tribe back in their favor, which is exactly what she does. This alliance of Sandra, Lil, and Dara shouldn't have worked. Lil was a particularly tough cat to wrangle as her vote seemed to shift with the wind and John and Burton were working overtime to split the votes of the three women in order to save their own necks. But in a pretty clever move, Sandra even fakes being depressed in order to hide the ruse from Fairplay, who takes the bait and makes her an offer of survival, that all she has to do is vote Dara and she'll make it to the next round. And Fairplay apparently takes promises pretty seriously, as he makes Sandra swear on her kids and even pull her fingers out from under the blanket so he can be super de duper sure she's not crossing them. Of course, Sandra and swear words go together well, but Sandra and swearing an oath? 
Not so much. So I said, I swear on my kids. And in my head and mumbling under my breath, I was like, I swear on my kids that I'm going to screw you and Burton. She does indeed screw him and Burton, as Burton's blindsided for the second time, and Sandra puts herself in position for a rather easy walk to her first million. If Sandra takes the easy route here and votes out Lil, Dara of one immunity this round, the absolute furthest she goes is final three. And fair play or Burton cakewalk to the win instead of her. Instead, Sandra earned her manipulating Lil merit badge at the most clutch time possible. Sandra's worst move, and this one pains me, is giving Denise her idol in Survivor Winners at War. On post-swap Decal, there were three original Decal in Tony, Sandra, and Kim, and two old Sele and Jeremy and Denise. After Boston Rob was voted out, Tony was rightfully worried that big threats are being targeted, so he forges a foursome with himself, Sandra, Kim, and Jeremy, the apparent big threats on the tribe, to vote out Denise, the apparent non-big threat. But Sandra wants to keep Denise over Jeremy and hatches a plan that is just a little too cute for its own good. Perhaps wildly overestimating the value of fire tokens, Sandra makes Denise the best deal in Survivor history, offering to give her an idol that expires after this tribal council in exchange for Denise's two fire tokens. Sandra's also itching to get Tony out of the game without any blood on her hands, so she trades the idol to Denise on the condition that she pretty please and pinky promise not to idle out Sandra or him, and only to idle out Tony or Jeremy. Denise even unsweetens the pot later, giving Sandra only one fire token now and one later after the votes are read. What Sandra didn't know is that Denise already had her own immunity idol, so at Tribal, Denise plays one idol for Jeremy, one idol for herself, and negates four votes against her. And in one of the biggest bamboozles ever, Denise casts her sole vote for Sandra, getting an idol, saving herself, and eliminating one of the biggest threats in the game for the cost of one fire token. Wow, actually, I guess they do have value. Sandra's greatest move across all four of her seasons of Survivor is her positioning herself as a palatable anti-Russell option for an increasingly frustrated and bitter jury in Survivor Heroes vs. Villains. At the final 10 of Heroes vs. Villains, there were three groups, a united five of heroes who emphatically believed Russell was the last remaining man up against an all-women alliance, an alliance of villains in Russell, Parvati, Danielle, and Jerry, and Sandra, who was ready to flip on the villains the second the merge happened. And try to flip she did, but the heroes under JT's deft leadership refused to hear her out, and only Rupert had the slightest inkling that Russell was not the upstanding moral citizen he appeared to be. When Rupert's the voice of reason in your alliance, you've got a problem. After being rebuffed by the heroes, Sandra had no choice but to return to the villains and vote with them. I don't want my big mouth to get me in trouble. I still want Russell out bad, but right now I'm stuck with Russell. I'm stuck with Russell. And the massive egos on the heroes tribe were severely bruised for not only falling hook, line, and sinker for Russell's shenanigans, but also for failing in such a spectacularly embarrassing fashion. All that hero embarrassment gave Sandra the unique opportunity to essentially rebrand as the anti-villain villain. The villain who votes with the villains, but who's really on the side of the heroes. And unlike other failed rebrands like Pepsi's awful smile logo, this one one actually worked. After JT was eliminated, Sandra gave just enough lip service to the remaining heroes to convince them she was on their side and seriously invested in making relationships with them, while still generally remaining loyal to the villain majority. Sure, Sandra went after Russell at both Final 10 and Final 9 and failed to get him out both times, but she then used that failure to essentially tell the heroes, I told you so, and to rub their noses in their failure to heed her warnings. By the time the end game rolls around, the heroes, both in the game and out, dislike Russell so much that even people in his orbit, like Parvati, are persona non grata when it comes to jury votes. So yeah, Sandra's inability to get Russell out, and then her subsequent positioning as the third party anti-Russell jury option later in the game, is her greatest move ever. 
and the queen stays queen. Got nothing else for you. To help me dunk on the Heroes Tribe long into the future, like and subscribe, and I'll get you more Survivor content just like this. Until next time, don't get idled out.